want to accomplish. Where are you going to put your time? And to me, it's really simple. It's really about improving our approach to flooding and what we're trying to do. See, sea level rise is a scientific fact. In South Florida, for the last several decades, we've experienced one to two inches per decade. And the city has a lot of things to be proud of. We have a program in, in place. We have the support of our community that voted 70% for our geo bonds. Our FEMA scores are improving. And we've made some important progress. And there's a lot of activity, by the way. We've got projects on Indian Creek, Palm Hibiscus. We're getting ready on West Avenue, Phase 2. I actually have an item on Wednesday's agenda about First Street. So sometimes when I hear things like there's a pause going on, I'm not exactly sure what to make of that, because I would tell you we've got a lot going on in this city. While there's some things we can be proud of, my headline is we need to do better. We need to do a lot better, and this group can play a role in it. So I want to touch on just a few things, top lines, and I'm happy offline to talk more, and you'll be hearing more about these, of things that I think we can do more of, and some things that we need to change. First, I'm a believer in our pumps. I want the cleanest pumps we can get, because water quality is so important, and our pipes. We need to upgrade our infrastructure. I'm all for that. I'm all for blue and green natural infrastructure. I proudly sponsored the Urban Land Institute and that infrastructure using natural solutions to bring water quality. I'm all in on that. Here's something I'm really in on, and that is fixing our darn seawalls. We've got water overtopping both public and private seawalls. Most of them, I think almost 90% plus are private. But we better get on that case. And you know, that's something that's happening to us right now. I'm all for and support enhanced private property adaptation. We've got to help our property owners. We've got to give them the information, the tools to make themselves and their properties uh, better. I'm for temporary pumps. You know, we're going to be at this for a long time. And if we've got water in the street now, I think we should be doing a little more. With the budget approaching $650 million, I think we can spend more than $330,000 on temporary pumps. We have water in the streets now that we need to address. I am all for resident engagement. We are at our best when we're listening to our residents. And I am so happy that Joe Centrina, our new IG, is here, because we need more IG oversight to what we're doing. So those are things that I'm for and that I think we uh, need to continue with. Let me tell you a few things we need to do better and that need to change. I do not support what I would term radical road raising, which may compromise private properties below ground. This is not the right approach. It's not just my opinion. You can see it with your own eyes. It's expensive. It's problematic. Frankly, I'm not sure it's necessary. We've done it in some areas, but we've also had success in some areas where we have used new pumps and pipes and kept dry. Example, Alton Road was an FDOT project completed in 2016. New pumps, new pipes, stronger street, doing just fine. Didn't raise the road one inch. So if you're asking one thing the city has to course correct and make improvement is we cannot have this type of road raising that compromises private property. The second thing I think we need to really expect is much better planning. Much better planning. What does the total budget look for this? We know we spent a few hundred million. Just a few years ago, you might have heard we were spending 300 million, and then maybe you heard we were spending 400 million, and then in a bond document I saw late 2017, I saw 650 million. My guess is next time we add up those numbers, they're not going down. And when you add in water and sewer infrastructure, which we need to do, we're, we're right now, folks, at a $1 billion plus dollar program. We need planning, we need to see what the total program budget looks like, we need to take our scarce resources and put them in the places that can really, really help. And finally, we need to simplify these projects and lower the burden on our neighborhoods. These projects are just too complicated, too big, 
going on way too long. And that's causing problems for us. So there are some things to feel good about. There are some things we're doing well and things I support. But I gotta be clear with you, we need to improve our game and I'm gonna fight hard to do that. Now I need your help. And I need your help in a couple different ways. First, on this road raising, I think we'll get our first unveiling of some ideas from Jacobs Engineering on Tuesday the 21st at 545. Um, at City Hall, and they'll be sharing some good analysis. They're a very reputable firm. They'll probably show you some analysis of how to keep streets dry. That needs to be balanced with the voice of the community and the real world experience, because residents are experts in their neighborhood and property, and they should also be heard as part of that uh, conversation. I think this is one of the most important citywide issues. So if there was ever an issue, and I'm looking at Tanya, I'm looking at this board, if there was ever an issue that called for MPU, I think it would be this. But I would say that this topic is gonna to be front and center. The commission has got five hours dedicated to a workshop on Monday the 27th. I'm excited to work with my colleagues on that. And I know if we listen to our residents, we listen to our neighborhoods, MBU gets on the field, I am very optimistic for our future, and we are gonna set the model of how to address flooding. Thank you very much. And, uh, I just wanna say, part of, I mentioned Inspector General Oversight, and uh, that means good news, we now have an office of Inspector General, MBU advocated for it, I was a proud advocate, Ron Stark, thank you contributed a lot, and just provides some really good checks and balances to what we're doing. So I am going to hand it over to our new IG, Joe Centurion. Of my personal heroes. 
there aren't many pictures that I keep around my desk. One of them is Janet Reno's picture, and, uh, uh, and what she stood for in terms of integrity is something that I've kept with me through my career. And I really have kind of found my way into a career in basically public integrity work. I spent 25 years at the State Attorney's Office, most of those years doing public corruption work, uh, basically. Uh, uh, you know, investigating and uh, prosecuting misconduct, criminal misconduct by uh, everything from uh, you know, elected officials to uh, to local administrators, uh, uh, public employees, anybody that was misusing a public position for some type of private gain. Uh, that was what I did for uh, most of those years, and 15 of those years, I was the chief of the corruption unit, which uh, we were there during some of the tough times during the 1990s when uh, really this uh, this county uh, had, uh, really was making a name for itself uh, nationally in that area. Uh, I'd like to think that we're in a better place now, that, that uh, things are not what they were. But, you know, it, it, vigilance is required uh, to ensure integrity in public. Uh, uh, that, that led me to, in, in 2011, uh, to take the position as director of the Miami-Dade Commission on Ethics, uh, which does have jurisdiction uh, with the ethics code and ethics codes in all the county and all of the municipalities. And uh, you know, there, were, there were times when I had to deal with issues that came up in, in the city of Miami Beach as, as well as elsewhere. Um, and I uh, got to know that side of the enforcement. It's not a criminal enforcement, but ethics, uh, ethics issues are very important because that's really the, the when you start seeing ethics violations, the, the next step, sometimes bribery, is, uh, comes uh, in its path. So I spent some years doing that. Um, and uh, so I was uh, fortunate enough to be, uh, to be selected to be the uh, Inspector General, uh, a newly elected, newly uh, created position, uh, the public voted 81 percent, 81 percent, and also with the support largely of the city uh, officials, uh, and the mayor and the city commission. For the most part, as far as I know, you know we're, we're behind this. And let me tell you, that's a pretty unusual thing. If you think that the public officials in municipalities are anxious to have an independent office of looking over their shoulders and, uh, you know, trying to and, and second guess them maybe or to uh, at least you know, determine whether somebody's uh, misbehaving. That's not something that local, local officials want, by and large. Uh, places in this uh, county that uh, they'll It'll be, it'll be a million years before they ever, ever uh, get behind it. But I think, you know, the, the, and, and this is not an indication that anything was particularly bad here, or at least worse than any place else. No, I think it was an indication that the, uh, the, the officials and the public here have high standards for uh, their public officials and for their, their local government. And they were looking for something to, uh, you know, to ensure that there is more oversight, that there is, uh, uh, you know, some more assurance given to the public that uh, that things in this municipality are operating properly uh, and corruption-free and a high degree uh, of ethics. Uh, and that, that's a, that's something everybody here really should be should be proud of. Frankly, I think it's a, it's a, it's something that says a lot about um, this community. So, what is it that? Uh, you actually did when you voted. Uh, I'm not going to assume everybody voted for it, but 81% of you voted for it. Let's put it that way. Uh, what exactly did you do? Well, this is the. Uh, I'll just read a little bit from the um, from the, the charter. Now, this is a, a charter amendment that was that was done here. So, and that that's extremely important. Uh, this is an office that's in the city charter. That's kind of the, the constitution of the city. So, uh, this is not something that's going to go away very easily. Um, it was created by the public, and only the public could get rid of this. So no matter what happens, no matter who, no matter who might be you know, unhappy with the, uh, whatever the Inspector General is doing, um, it, to abolish the office, it's going to take uh, the public to vote to abolish the office. Um, I am, uh, and the Inspector General is accountable to the City Commission, to the extent that you know, a five out of seven 
vote of the city commission can dismiss the inspector general. They can't get rid of the office. Uh, and they have to fund the office, but they can dismiss the inspector general, I would hope, for serious uh, wrongdoing uh, uh, that uh, would justify it. Um, so, um, you know, we have created this office. What does the office, what does the, what does the, the charter say? I'll uh, just, I'm going to read all of it just a little bit. The Office of Inspector General is established as an independent body to perform investigations, audits, reviews, and oversight of municipal matters, including city contracts, programs, projects, expenditures, in order to identify deficiencies and to detect, investigate, and prevent fraud, waste, mismanagement, misconduct, and abuse of power. That's a pretty broad mandate. As almost, and that could, that could include just about anything going wrong in the city government, in the city's contracts, uh, you know, among city employees or officials, uh, almost anything uh, of, a, of a negative nature uh, virtually. So that's a pretty broad, broad mandate. And then it goes on to say that in the charter that we will have, the Inspector General will have subpoena power, that's the right to legally compel people to give testimony, to come before it, and tell us what you know, to produce documents, to produce records. That's a, that's a very powerful legal tool. I mean, when I was at the State Attorney's Office, we had that, uh, that we were investigating criminal misconduct, but this is really in pursuit of those broad goals for the Inspector General. We have been given the power to compel people. You know, some of these people aren't going to be want, aren't going to be happy to get a subpoena, but I mean to compel people to give information, to give documents and evidence, um, you know, whether you know whether they want to do it uh, or not. So I mean that's that's a that's a very, very significant power. It, and, and, and think of this, investigations, what investigations of any kind of wrongdoing, audits, we, I, I inherited uh, part, of the, you know, part of the structure of the office is that the former internal auditors uh, who used to be under the city manager are now under the inspector general. And there are about eight of them or so. And uh, they conduct audits of, you know, they, the tax audits of, on all of the resort taxes that are due to the city, sanitation taxes. Um, and they also conduct compliance audits, uh, you know, of any of city departments, of city contractors, you know, to, to make sure that they're they're properly performing their duties and they're accounting for uh, uh, city resources properly and so forth. So I mean, that was, and then oversight. The word oversight. I mean, that's that's, that's a broad broad uh, uh, spectrum of things. Uh, also reviews. Reviews. Huh? Want to, we don't have to call it an investigation. We can say we want to review this department, we want to review this operation, this, this particular um, uh, project or program. Uh, we have the right to do that. And nobody can say we can't do that. I mean, basically, it's a, it's a very, very uh, uh, strong and, and in now independent uh, agency within the city government that uh, you know, is there really with one mandate, keep everybody honest and, and make sure that the city is making, you know, doing the, it's best for the citizens in terms of the way it expends its resources uh, and the way it spends its, its money and the, way, and the way it contracts um, and so forth. So uh, hugely, uh, hugely independent. Now, given all that power, I mean, that's, that, 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 that you know, power is a dangerous thing. It's a, somebody called it the ultimate aphrodisiac, I think. But it is a, uh, you know, that's a, that's a huge responsibility I mean, to have that kind of power. And it's subject to, you know, the wrong, the wrong person exercising power can create a lot of havoc. So uh, I think that's counterbalanced somewhat, even though it's independent, even though it has the tremendous investigative power. It, we don't really, it doesn't have any power to do anything other than the investigation or the auditing or the oversight. In other words, I or the Inspector General doesn't have the right to order anybody in the city to change a policy. Uh, you don't have the right to fire anybody. You don't have the right to 
you know, to really to, to make any decisions. I mean, the city commission and the city management has that power. Um, so our power really is in many ways the power of persuasion and the power if we get the support of the public, which I think we, we already have, 81%, um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the power to, to, uh, to uh, make things known, to make things transparent, to put out in front of the public all the facts that we can, and then let the process work. And uh, you know, public officials are accountable in, in elections and so forth to their uh, constituents. And you know, that that is the, the source of our power in a sense comes from you. All right. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, if if we uh, say something and it's important enough, and you don't think that the, the that the that the city government is responding because we can't we can't we can tell them what what we think they should do. Or we can can give them the facts, but it doesn't compel them to do so. Hopefully they will, hopefully they'll, you know, they will. And I think that, you know, the indications are that they are interested in this office and using this office in the right way. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, somebody, somebody asked me, and I suppose somebody probably would ask me, uh, um, who, who do you report to? Well, I mean, the answer really, I mean, to, well, I, mean I, I do report to the city commission in the sense that I'm going to be sending information, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't report to them. I don't really, I don't really report to anybody in particular. Um, so what I'm doing here tonight is I'm reporting to the people that established this, you know, this, this agency. I have, it's not the first time I've been here in public. I, will, I made it known that I will, I will go and speak before any group in the city that wants to hear from the Inspector General, because I think in large part, this is the reporting that I need to do. I mean, I need to report to the public and let them know what their Inspector General, the person who basically is there acting as an ombudsman for the public interest, for the public good. Um, and uh, you know, that's, that, that's, that's part of what I think I'm supposed to do, and in large part why uh, I'm here. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the things in it's, it's in the order. It's now we have. I just read to you part of the uh, the charter. So we read the charter. But it's also in the city order. The city commission adopted an ordinance that lays out in more detail, you know, the powers and duties and responsibilities of the inspector general. One of which is to monitor the geologic program. All right. And uh, one of the next uh, speakers, Marie's right there. She uh, will uh, be uh, you know giving you the update on that. But no, that's a $139 million program. And, uh, you know, I, and frankly, uh, I, I'll, I'll stick around for that because I'm, I'm supposed to. But uh, also, uh, by the way, she's a she's a, she's a crack and jack employee. She's a, she's, a, she's a really excellent. But, um, you know, that's that's really the purpose of this office to engage in that kind of that kind of oversight. Okay. Um, well, just quickly, um, uh, we'll, we'll, the, the most important thing I think we, uh, most important resource we have is information. Uh, for my office to be successful, we've got to get information. We've got to get more information than anybody else in the city. Okay, so that means that people have to feel comfortable coming to us, calling us. Uh, they see something wrong, let us know about it. Um, we can give whistleblower protection to people. To, you know, I know that the people in the city government, a lot of them, you know, they're, they're hesitant to come forward. They're concerned about their jobs. There's whistleblower protection under state law and under local ordinance. Um, we can, uh, uh, you know, we, we have a hotline uh, and people can call us and anonymously. I had two uh, appointments uh, this week. One was from Anonymous. The other one was Mr. Smith. You think that was his real name? No, it wasn't. Uh, and, you know, basically we'll evaluate the information. If it's, if it's good, we'll follow up on it. So, I mean, people should feel comfortable coming to us. We're in the old city hall, uh, you know, away from the, the, the city government, so people can come up there and nobody, nobody's gonna know uh, that, you're, that you're coming to visit with us. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's that, that informational part. We're gonna have a website. The website's in preparation. It should be, within the next few uh, weeks, should be going out there. So, um, you know, I will be going around the city trying to, uh, you know, to let people know uh, what the office is about, what it, uh, uh, what it can do, and uh, the fact that uh, you know, those of you who have a real strong feeling about something in the city government and you just don't feel comfortable saying it to somebody in the city, then 
you can come to us and, uh, and uh, that's that. Nobody needs to know about it. So um, uh, I guess uh, we, we want to ask some, give people a chance to ask a couple questions. Uh, so um, yes, right in the front row here. We got, uh, um, question, 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 question. Uh, you mentioned a few times uh, us. How many people are in the office? Are we in the office? Uh, well, okay, uh, that's, that's a fair question to ask. I've got, I, I mean, in terms of, of new staff, very little, to be honest with you. We have, I inherited a staff of eight auditors, but they were there with the city before, so they're not new employees, but they're now under my authority. So, um, you know, and I, by the way, I, I some of the things that, that they would do, have done in the past, which might not have been, you know, circulated that you know, much in the city, are going to be much more public and transparent now than they have been. I've hired an investigator. I'm about to hire a second investigator. I might possibly be able to hire another staff person uh, this, this, this year, but uh, that's probably about it. Um, so to a large extent, I'm gonna have to, you know, I'm gonna have to use when necessary. I have re the police resources at you now that I met with them and they're gonna support me in, in investigations if necessary. And I certainly know how to find the ethics commission and the state attorney if that's necessary. Do you have a certain framework or process or methodology about uh, prioritizing uh, investigation that come to you? In terms of how do you how do you prioritize? How do I prioritize? Well, that's a, that's a that's a that's a that's a great question. Well, you know, you, you, I can tell you there are there are a, and I've done this kind of work a long time. I mean, I, I said the state attorney's office, I said the ethics commission. I, I know that there's a lot of a lot of times you get stuff that comes in over the transom that isn't all that. Significant doesn't fall within our, you know, our, 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 our jurisdiction. Really. I mean, one of the things that happens is anybody who gets fired or gets demoted, and you know, thinks they have a, you know, they have a big, you know, somebody's being showing favoritism, and you know, so it's a personnel matter. That's not that's not what we're here for. We're not here to resolve personnel issues. We're really here to to look at the big picture and the, the, the bigger ticket. I have things that involve you know, expenditures of substantial amounts of city resources. Um, you know, significant abuses of public power. Um, if if it's a minor, if it's a fairly really minor thing that just involves it, it's something that should be resolved at the administrative level. You know, I'll call up the department head or you know, say, look, this is you know, I got to take care of this. But I'm not going to get involved in this as far as you know, exercising the power of my office. Um, I'll, I'll give advice to the you know, to the to the, the individual involved or to the department head or the manager and she probably have it resolved administratively because you, can, you know, we're not going to be able to do everything for everybody. So I think that's a, that's a fair question and how we use the limited resources of our office is really I think a, a key component of, of what the inspector generals do. Yes? So do you have a plan of action or do you respond to what comes up? Well that's, that's, a, that's a difficult, well I think both. You know, I mean, there are, there are certainly every day. You know, there's a possibility of a, of, some, of getting a phone call that creates a very big investigation. I mean, I, I've known that over the years. I mean, you never know when it's coming, and sometimes the biggest cases come just like that. You couldn't plan on it. You, you know, but um, yeah, I think there is also, you know, our auditors, for instance, we can decide okay, where, where where are we going to set, where are we going to have them audit, where in the city. You know, we, we do have a, there was a study done that uh, showed certain of the vulnerable areas in the city government. You know, so, I mean, chances are, we're going to, you know, in terms of auditing, we're going to try to direct some of our resources into areas that we really, that we think need to be because of, because of their susceptibility to corrupt activity. And, you know, I, mean, I think they know where they are. I mean, they, they, they often people who interact with the public in terms of regulation, and, you know, just, just a few weeks ago, they had uh, somebody in the parking department get arrested you know, for uh, really an unbelievably you know, foolish thing that, that, that he did. Um, but, you know, taking money from to give people special um, special consideration. So, now there are certain areas that you just traditionally need oversight. You know, the, the contracting process is always an area that needs it needs special uh, oversight. So, you know, we're going to prioritize. You know, certain areas in terms of where we look, but um, as I said, the, uh, the the most powerful asset we have is information, um, and uh, we will do everything we can to encourage city employees, the general public, to uh, bring us that information. 
because that's really the way to keep, uh, to keep government honest. And an agency like that, we will certainly, certainly look at it. And uh, we'll, again, we are going to be able to, you know, enforce something. But I, when, I, when we get the information, you know, we know who to go to. We'll, we'll, we'll bring it to the correct enforcement authority to, uh, you know, to deal with whatever agency it is. Hi, my name is Jeff Conley. Uh, city of Miami Beach has ordinances uh, prohibiting uh, city vendors from making campaign contributions under most circumstances. Uh, and I wondered whether the scope of your office includes uh, finding out uh, whether uh, you know, we, we've been inundated with political action committees which are very hard to uh, trace the sources of their income. And it, it seems logical to me that a uh, vulnerability there would be that uh, city vendors and other people prohibited from making campaign contributions directly to candidates are utilizing those political action committees. And I wonder whether your scope of, and jurisdiction includes that. Uh, in terms of investigation, I think so, yes. Uh, yes, we, I mean, that's something we would, we would look at. Now, uh, the enforcement side of that is really the, it's the Ethics Commission. Uh, I come from the Ethics Commission, so I know this. Uh, the Ethics Commission that actually enforces that ordinance, the one. And uh, so, more than likely, if we got information that indicated that was going on, we would, we would get with the Ethics Commission and maybe jointly investigate it. And so that if it, we determine there's a violation, um, you know, there's an enforcement aspect right, right there. Uh, th those are tough cases to prove, by the way. You know, I, I have some experience in that area. So, uh, and there are ways that people get around that ordinance, uh, you know, legally uh, sometimes. And uh, uh, it's frustrating because I know what the intent of the ordinance is. And it's trying to you know, keep that influence, that, pri that special private in influence, out of public policy as much as possible. Will that ever happen completely? No, uh, certainly not. But uh, we, we, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good ordinance, and not many, not many municipalities have that. Um, and I, I've always appreciated the fact that uh, you know, Miami Beach does have, you know, in, in terms of its ethics ordinances and ethics standards, they're stronger than most places. Uh, uh, getting the, the, the proof to prove a violation sometimes can be difficult. Do we have any other questions before we switch gears? Once, going twice. Yeah, one question. last one. If you ask the average citizen in Miami Beach, the average citizen will tell you that developers own Miami Beach. So, is your role part of looking into that? The, 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 the developers own Miami Beach, and what was the question? They do whatever they want. Is your, is your role sort of have an impact on that? Well, certainly to the extent that they may be you know, exerting too much influence in governmental and public affairs. I mean, that's how they have a right, obviously, to have lobbyists and to to uh, to make you know make an effort to get what they want from the government. But uh, if they if they don't they don't follow the rules, you know, there are lobbying rules that that, that exist. Uh, if they uh, you know step over the line in terms of offering inducements to things, you know, yes, those are things that we would certainly. We would want to. We'd be interested in. I think the state attorney would be interested in them too. But um, you know, we, we, that, that, that that's a central problem in government at all levels, uh, making it honest and, and, and trying to keep out uh, influences that don't serve the public. Uh, uh, it, it's a constant problem. It's going to be with us forever. But uh, I think we are part of the the structure that can at least work to minimize that. But part of it is they do it through the rules. They they get people to change the rules. Okay, I think that is a bigger issue than what we're here for. It's a topic we could talk about for hours and hours. Um, so I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh,
you, um, but also here and useful for folks to know about. Kevin, could you raise your hand for a second, please? Everyone, that's Kevin Polito. He's the community outreach uh, resource person for the city. And if you have questions about things like finding out what's going on about the geo bond on the website or other um, website questions or general information, he's a great person, a great first stop to work with. Um, so I'm going to once again get out of the way of everybody and let the experts do their thing. Thank you. This is okay. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having us. Um, we're going to have about 15 minutes of a presentation, and I'm hoping that I'm not telling you too many things that you already know. I can never take that for granted, um, but I don't want to spend too much time. I know it's late. Everybody probably wants to go home. Um, so my name is Maria Hernandez, and I'm the director of the Giovanni program for the city of Miami Beach. I'm joined uh, by the city CFO, John, who you already know, um, and by the current chair of our um, Giovanni Oversight Committee, Karen Rivo. Karen was also the chair of the citizens-led uh, Mayor's Ribbon Committee um, during the whole 2018 campaign. So. Um, as you all know, uh, the GeoBond got overwhelming support of 70% in all three of the ballot measures um, that were uh, voted on by you all. And as soon as that happened, um, it really became a mandate for city staff to begin planning, uh, designing, and implementing all 57 projects which were included as part of those three ballot questions. So the very next month, in December, um, right after the vote, uh, the city manager, Jimmy Morales, sent a memorandum to city staff and to the mayor and commission. Um, and it, it really conveyed his vision of how the GeoBond program would be managed and implemented. So if you look at the org chart, this is basically how we manage the program. Um, the implementation plan, of course, it involves a combination of staff leadership, resident oversight, and of course now an independent um, inspector general office. So it's being managed in-house by a four-person team, which is myself, Allison, Thais, and Devin Ramirez, um, and we report directly to the city manager. The team um, also, we also have internal departments that work with us and are involved and assist um, with the program, uh, such as communications, uh, our procurement departments, our budget and finance departments, and our, um, our resiliency department. And then you have the 57 projects that are being implemented and executed by different, what we call, owner departments. And that's, those are all the departments you see at the bottom. CIP, Parks and Rec, um, Tourism and Culture, Public Safety. So the manager's vision was basically to have a centralized program management for decentralized project delivery. So in January of last year, um, of course you all may know that the Geobond Oversight Committee was formed by the Mayor and Commission. Um, the committee's basic role is to help keep staff accountable to timelines and budgets. Um, and this is the way they are organized. Um, the committee is chaired by Karen, who, as I mentioned, has been involved um, with the development of the program since the very beginning. And then the remaining committee members include voting members, which have a representation from North Beach, Middle Beach, and South Beach, as well as non-voting members from different city committees, such as uh, budget, um, uh, parks, and sustainability, and audit. So the committee has been meeting on a monthly basis since January to help ensure that the program is on track, uh, on time, and on budget. And ever since Mr. Santorino came on board last November, um, he's also attended every meeting. And um, he's getting up to speed pretty quickly on all the program activities. When he began, um, he really didn't reach out to me. I reached out to him. Um, and um, I gave him an update on how everything we've done over the last year. So since the program team got started last year, we've dedicated a lot of hours to making the GeoBomb program as transparent as possible. And with the help of our IT department, um, we developed a resource that um, serves as an information tool for residents. That platform, or the GeoBomb Project Dashboard, which we launched in October, um, and is also 
by the way, mentioned on page 24 of the latest uh, magazine that you all probably already got in the mail. Um, it's, it's what we're here really to walk through with you today. Um, and the dashboard data is, um, it's an open data platform. And what it does is that it makes all geobomb program activity and expense information available to the public in real time. Uh, our goal now in 2020 is to visit all of the city's HOAs and show residents how to use the dashboard features so that they can be empowered with information. Um, and since the dashboard is pulled directly from the city's budget books and project program management software, um, elected officials, city staff, and residents can now really share all of the same information. So the entire website, uh, which is on uh, www.geombinfo.com, um, um, has really transformed the way our team is able to showcase uh, progress to members of the public. Um, our community information manager, Allison, is going to show you how to navigate the dashboard in a few minutes. But before she does that, I just want to give you a summary snapshot of where we are on the program today. So. The bonds were approved in April of 2019. That is really when the program officially began, since that is when the program was funded. Um, this is a 12 year long program, and the funding is split into four buckets of funding that are referred to as tranches. So we are nine months into the first year of the first tranche of funding, otherwise known as tranche one which spans from 2019 to 2022. Tranche 1 has $151 million worth of funding, or about 35% of the entire GOMON, which is shown as a blue line on the program expenditures donut on the right-hand side. The project activity donut <laughs> shows that 38 out of the 57 projects in the GOMON, or 67%, are being completed and or are starting during tranche one. So 67% of all of the projects are using about 35% of the GeoBond funds. So how are we doing? Well, as of today, we've completed three projects. Um, we have another 31 in some form of active status, meaning that they are either in a planning phase, a design phase, or a construction phase. This means that 89% of all of the projects in Tranche 1 are either active or completed today. Out of that 31 that are active, there's 11 that are under construction or have a component that is under construction. So we have currently paid out, and you see this um, also on the right, about $13.6 million, uh, which are paid out to contractors for work that has already been done, or consultants. And we've encumbered or committed um, another $19.5 million. So we have a total of $33 million today, or 22% of the bond of the funds in tranche one already committed or paid out. So Allison is now going to show you how the dashboard works, and then our CFO will say a couple of words, and then we'll close it out with uh, our committee chair before we take any questions. Thank you. Go ahead, Allison. Oh, sorry. Hello, I'm Allison. Um, before we begin, I'm going to embarrass our two other, I'm not bringing you up here, don't worry, but I want to point them out because I feel like Maria and I are kind of the more visible ones, but Thais and Devin, they really helped to keep us on track with all these projects. Okay. Um, by the way, I'm a beach kid, I went to my new beach senior high, I grew up in the area, so I get it, you know. Um, you can call, call me for anything, seriously, I'm your community information manager. If you ever need a question on anything, there's a whole stack of cards um, that I put on the table on your way out. Feel free to call me anytime. On, I have my cell phone number on there, call me whenever. Um, all right, let's get started. So just so you know how we got here, um, you will go to the Projects tab, and this is what will pop up. Um, these dynamic donuts, as our CFO, John Woodruff, likes to call them, um, are dynamic, so you can kind of click around and uh, focus in on the things that you want to see. Um, 
then to drill into a certain project, let's say, or you want to just browse, what kind of projects do we have? We have 57 total projects, you know, as most of you know, and these are the buckets, parks and recreation and cultural facilities, neighborhoods and infrastructure, and police, fire, and public safety. So you can click on one of those if you just want to see the projects in that area, or you can search by uh, North Beach, Middle Beach, or South Beach. You can see all citywide. I'm going to click all for now. This is the page, and I know it's a little hard to see for some of you, but I'm hoping that all of you will go home and log in and kind of try to navigate this yourself. Um, so the purpose of this, like Mario stated, is we're really trying to put the, put the tools that we all have in the hands of the residents. So literally, this um, information is the same information we have as program managers. So now from you know, your home uh, screens, and by the way, this works best on a desktop you know, computer or laptop. It's uh, not great on a, on a uh, handheld device if you're trying to check that out right now. Um, so you can see a lot, of the same, a lot of the features that are here, but this actual dashboard is best on, on a computer. Um, all right, so this map gives you information if you hover over the little dots, um, greens for parks, you know, yellows for infrastructure, reds for public safety. Um, one thing that's interesting is we have applied for a Knight Foundation grant, and hopefully, we, um, if we end up winning, uh, we would get more funding to put into this map feature. So we have a, like more of a GIS type map where you can really drill in and see, okay, what streets are being paved. Um, where did we install a new LED light? Like literally which street corners did we install a new LED light? Um, where exactly are the seawalls that we're doing across uh, the city? So we're trying to make this a bit more robust, but one unique thing is that this is all done in-house. So, um, and I actually think that this, you know, actually our C CIO who worked for the Pentagon once, believes that this is uh, the best uh, general obligation bond website that he has seen for that for that purpose that it pulls real-time information directly from our budget books. So whatever you see here is what the budget book is. If you call finance, you know, budget, ask what, you know, how much has been spent on a project, this is literally what they're looking at. Um, all right. So once you're here, you can also filter this way. There's a search bar that makes things easy. Let's say you want pull apart. You type in pull apart, and it'll show up. Um, let's take a look at Polar Park. So here's kind of an overview on how much we've spent total, and on top of that, there's a large encumbered uh, dollar amount as well. Sorry, this keeps popping up. I'll have to talk to IT more. Um, <laughs> all right, so you, you select the, uh, the project that you want to learn more about, and this little window pops up. So right off the bat, you get um, you know, the map zeroes in on where that site is. It's in Mid Beach, um, Polo Park. It gives you the uh, scope of work there. And it talks about the, the budget of that specific project and then how much we've spent. In this case, we are complete with that project. So now, this is something that a lot of you might be doing. Uh, clicking, right, on this, which says to hover. So we're going to try to learn to hover better. <laughs> and I'm going to show you some tricks, though, as well. Let's go back here. Let's see the parts view. Let's take a look at our 70 second street project. So you're going to hover down here where it says project slash sub projects. And this window is going to come up. If you move your mouse away, you will lose it. OK? So keep your mouse hovered. But this has all kinds of information. I know it's really tiny. I'm about to blow it up for you a bit. Um, but you know, the scope of work, the update there is the most recent update. Um, this, like I said, this is refreshed daily or even more than once daily. Um, so this is what's in our you know, uh, software. You get a start date and an end date. That end date is supposed to be the end date of construction. So sometimes when something's complete, we are still paying out uh, finances. 
um, that will be mentioned in that update. You've got your contact information, which, like I said, you could always call me if you're having trouble finding information, but each of the 57 projects are managed by our particular department. So in this case, it's Capital Improvement Project, CIP, and you've got your contact name, email, and phone number. So here's the trick. If you don't like the hover situation, if you don't like that you can copy paste this information, if you don't like that you can print it, email it to people, you right click. And by the way, we're putting a video tutorial up here in the next week, so it'll have all of this. Right click, drill through, project detail. I know it's kind of a lot. And it opens to its specific page. So this is where you'd be able to print from, copy paste from, you can click to email your contact person directly, for example. Um, tells you all about the funding. Um, it gives you an encumbered amount. And by the way, this funding, this funded number is what we have available now. So in this particular case, um, it explains in the scope that this is actually a $53 million project. Um, we have $10.8 million available now because that's what's available in tranche one in the first issuance of the bond. All right, it talks about how much we've spent so far and it gives you a very detailed timeline, planning, design, and construction. All right, we have that note, by the way, down here that this project has additional sources of funding. Let's go back, go back. So, I'm um, gonna take questions in a minute, but you know, click around, Go home to your home computer, open up some different projects. For a lot of these, you're going to see that it's a future project, such as Palm Island Park here. So it's active phase future. Um, and whenever that happens, the update will tell you why. So this pro uh, project is in tranche two, and it's programmed between the years of 2022 and 2025. So in 2022, this timeline is going to become dynamic and active, and you'll get all that detailed information. We'll start with planning, go to design, and then construction. Um, all right, so those are the main features. Um, then the one other really cool thing down here, progress report, or you can reach it up here at the top. But what this says here is this project dashboard generates a daily program progress report. So everything you just saw on the dashboards gets uh, posted as a PDF every single morning uh, to this program progress report tab. This is also a printable, downloadable, shareable, emailable version of everything you saw there. You know, it's something that you could use at your neighborhood association meetings, um, something you could bring to commission meetings. This is here like a whole summary of everything going on. Active phase, end dates, budget, spend, they covered. You know, like our um, Inspector General stated, information is everything. So we're really trying to be as transparent as possible here. Um, and like I said, we're trying to even take this to a whole new level if and when we get that grant money. Um, uh, I think we'll open it up for questions. So we kind of just wanted to teach you how to use this thing. And, yeah. Sean, want to say something? Like Karen, maybe? Yeah. Then you can scroll down to an individual project page. So, you know, when we were doing conducting the voter education campaign about a year ago, uh, we heard a lot from our residents about their high expectations, their need for transparency, their need for follow through on the spot. So, we heard that loud and clear. And then we also knew, knew that there was going to be an inspector general checking everything we were doing. Um, and we knew there was going to be a resident oversight committee checking everything. So we realized, you know what, if we're going to build something, let's just go for it, you know? So what we did was we did some research on some of the other geobond sites in the country and some folks who had done it recently, Dallas, Denver, some other big ones. And so we looked at it and we realized, you know, even doing whatever that is, it's gonna, it almost takes like a small army of people to update this stuff all the time. And what we were thinking is, we, run, we try to run a fairly lean operation, 
So what we were thinking is, why don't we just tie right in to the primary data source? So if we have CIP capital people doing project management, let's just pull it right out of there instead of trying to keep so having shadow systems and, and, and doing this more than once. And in our financial system, let's just pull the information right out of there and have a daily refresh so folks can help themselves. You can see it, you don't, you know, sometimes getting the status of a project can frankly be pretty frustrating and take a little while. Where now, you, you check something immediately. And then if you still have questions about it, no problem. But at least you got a quick, uh, you know, easy data source. So, you know, we, we showed you kind of the dashboard look and then this is a report view. You can obviously print out any individual page you want from there and so on. So, you know, it, was, it took a lot of work, but these ladies really worked hard with our IT department to deliver on that kind of vision that we had to try to create something like this that hopefully meets that expectation or maybe even exceeds it you know, that, uh, for transparency and accountability. So I just wanted to say a few words there and thank these ladies for working hard to uh, make it happen. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll come over with the mic. Thank you. This is an excellent presentation. I'm curious about the Knight Foundation grant. Can you tell us a little bit about what the proposal is and how much money and the purpose of the grant? Thank you. Sure. And this is Karen Rio, by the way, uh, our awesome Geobon Oversight Committee Chair. Um, so yes, um, that grant, it's, for, it's a call for ideas for open data. Um, so the award uh, could be, they're actually giving away up to a million dollars, but they want to give out multiple awards, and so the actual award would end up being from 100,000 to 150,000. Um, so we're hoping on getting a piece of that million dollar pie. So I think we find out in the next month or two. What the it's an open data um, platform award, and we can actually tell them what we want. Um, so yeah, it's uh, yes, it's wide open, and what we want is another staff member who is focusing on GIS. Okay. Hi. Hi. I, I've looked at this website a couple times. It's really impressive, and you should be pleased with the outcome. Um, as good as this is, um, the city of Miami Beach spends about $350 million a year itself on an ongoing basis. And if you go to their OpenGov website and try to figure out what the heck is going on, it's like impossible. How do you transfer this type of learning into the actual budget, which frankly, from a taxpayer's perspective, is actually much larger. Yeah, I'm gonna hand this to John in a second, but I do know real quick that um, it is part of the manager's goals to uh, produce more of these open data dashboards, and our, T our IT department is on that, working with each department on uh, putting something together you know, for each department that kind of pulls the data automatically, so we're working on to do this more. So one of the challenges when you're trying to report out on like the city's budget, you know, it's, it's really all the programs and services of the city all turned into numbers, if you will. So it's a challenge to use any tool, frankly, to try to create kind of the, that look and feel, that understanding. So we've at least tried to leverage some of the existing tools or other open gov happens to be one of the more popular ones. In the last couple of years, though, the tool we're using here, Microsoft Business Intelligence, has come out where it, it doesn't take, you know, it's not an act of God to get some of this information in a readily, easily viable form for anyone to review. So we're actually, we, we've been very pleased with this experience and learned a lot from it. And we're going to try to build out, as Allison mentioned, more and more. Uh, using this as a model. So one of the first things we're going to see is all the other capital projects that are in the city. Right now, these are just the GeoBond ones. You're going to see a similar dashboard for all the capital projects in the city. There's often a lot of questions about what's the status of those. Well, when we were solving this, we were trying to crack the code on this problem. We are like, we might as well do that at the same time. So that's uh, coming in the very near term. And then also just also, in addition to, well, what is the budget? Well, what's the performance me metrics that go with it? Like, what is the level of service for a lot of our uh, different 
programs and services. What are our programs and services? So just FYI, I don't want to bore you too much with budget stuff, but we've created a program style budget. It's a, actually, Ron Starkman was, is on the budget advisory committee. He's been part of that process to help push for a program style budget. The challenge is to take that and easily be able to share it with folks and see it. We're still trying to figure that out. But we're trying to take every single program in the budget and say, okay, what are the programs? What is the level of service? How many people? How much budget? It's a basic and activity-based costing type uh, approach for the city's budget. So there's a lot of exciting things going on. This is really one of the first tangible ones we can really uh, show folks. So I'm looking forward, hopefully, to having more examples soon. John. Hi. Uh, Ms. Wicker, when you came to uh, the Flamingo Park Neighborhood Association, we exchanged a little bit about how you plan to pay for the maintenance of these geobond projects over time. And uh, for instance, we've had one in our neighborhood, uh, the complete repaving of uh, Meridian Avenue. Now, I don't know what the expected life of that project is, uh, but somebody does. And uh, have, we are now having the budget process for this current year. Is there anything in this budget uh, looking ahead? Uh, every condo association member in this room, and there are a lot, I'm sure, are, are aware that they have to create a reserve fund. Uh, do you do anything like that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And one that actually came up during the, uh, the advisory panel's uh, you know, review of all the different potential projects when we finally selected which ones, there was a lot of discussion, frankly, about what would be the O&M operating and maintenance costs of some of these projects. And so we spent a lot of time on that and, and charting out, okay, you know, four or five years from now, let's say the 72nd Street complex comes on board, how much is that going to cost? And maybe we do it halfway into a fiscal year, so then we can kind of spread that cost out. Um, is there any other big project coming on around the same time? So we've done a lot of that analysis. We have it in, in a lot of cases, like let's say the fire station one, um, that place took a lot of operating maintenance every year, as is. So when we are building a new one, it's actually going to decrease. So in some cases, depending on what it is, that asset could actually cost a little bit less. But um, during that whole process, we talked a lot about the city's lack of uh, capex or capital expenditure uh, dollars uh, on a normal basis. That's why some of the projects in the geobond maybe felt a little maintenance in nature, like sidewalks and streets and that kind of thing. So we're trying to use the geobond as a, as a chance to get caught up and then try and get some funding in place over the next few years. I know that Ron's been working hard uh, on that. In fact, I think we're giving a presentation tomorrow, right, at the Budget Advisory Committee. So that issue is, is that we, we're sensitive to it and we're, we're trying to get there because we've seen what happens if that's ignored. And, and when the Great Recession occurred, a lot of that funding was taken away and, and not restored. Uh, I actually asked you this question a couple of years ago, so I'm going to ask it to you again. Okay, based on, did you guys, are you guys going now and asking for, for the um, infrastructure and the CUIS projects? Are you asking for any state and federal matching dollars on any of these projects? I know that you said a year and a half ago that you couldn't do it because you didn't have specifics, but now that you guys are having specifics and details, are you asking the state or federal and you have gotten any matching? I know you're asking for the night. Are you asking for any other? Yeah, the answer to that is absolutely. So what happens is as these projects begin to get designed, uh, like I think the part three is a good example, where we have a grants team, and, and actually that grants team recently got elevated up to the city manager's office because we know that we need to leverage a lot of grants, not just for the GeoProm program, but for the resiliency projects that are coming up, right? So uh, that, that office has actually been elevated up to supervised by the city manager's office. Uh, they're, they're trying to give it more horsepower. And so what happens is, uh, as major grants become available and they say, hey, we have some funding available in this next funding cycle, we look at our portfolio of projects and which ones would make the most sense to apply for the different various grants. And so um, as those, those, a lot of those applications are, are now been submitted and we're hoping and waiting to see what the results are on at least this first wave 
of big projects. They tend to be for the bigger projects, not for like a replace uh, a playground project in a particular park for a couple hundred grand. It's, it's a lot of the big ticket projects, and those are really just now getting to the point where they're designed and we can uh, and we can apply. So I'm very hopeful that a year from now we'll be able to say, hey, we've leveraged ten million dollars or something like that. Any more questions? Okay.
our committee members. It is not to pick the paint colors. Our committee was tasked to make sure that these projects are delivered on time, on budget, and in the scope that was promised. And when we're new into it, when things start getting off track in any of those areas, it's up to us to advise the commission and, and, and to figure out what to do. Um, we are, you see how transparent everyone is. I invite you to come to our meetings. Um, I do have two public uh, hearing times at the meeting to allow anyone to speak or to ask a question. And, um, you know, we're just very open. To, uh, the staff, I think, as you already know, are just, to me, um, so excellent and so fair. I think we're really blessed. So I feel so privileged to chair this uh, really important work for this community. And I hope at the end of 12 years we'll all look back and say this was done beautifully. Uh, and we shall be proud of it. So um, if there's any other questions or comments, uh, otherwise I don't know who closes out the MBU meeting. I guess it's mine. It, it is me because I have a microphone, so I don't want to do that. Um, yes, if, any more questions before we close out the meeting? Lovely. So um, congratulations to our newest board members and our returning board members. Um, and just a quick announcement, our next event we're going to have is going to be a town hall on short-term rentals here in Miami Beach, and we're putting together a great panel on this, both uh, for and against, so it's going to be very lively. Bring your popcorn. Um, other than that, thank you very much for attending this evening, and if you haven't paid your membership dues, remember, please pay them online, $25, and you can give any payments to Saul, who's sitting right here in the chest. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Have a good evening.